And I remember he charged me something like 200 bucks for six months of training. It was something crazy <laughs> or 150, something like that. That's it for the whole six months. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was something crazy like that. A lot of pros, of course, of the genetic predisposition to really respond well. Like me, Derek, and Leo, we analyzed the cycle of a top Olympia competitor, and he was running maybe two, two and a half grams of gear in total. It was a lot of different compounds, and some of it didn't make yeah. sense. Just like Jay Cutler's cycle didn't really make sense. But that's, oh my God, I, I did a video on it, and I, I yeah. keep, like he didn't even seem to know the difference between uh, he didn't even seem to know the trend in um, uh, parabola. Parable and we're the same thing. <laughs> yeah. But I think I always have a feeling that some of the pros they do a little bit of a diversion tactic, and it you can't really fault them for it because they've been using this kind of diversion for so long, working for the fitness magazines and with muscle tech and their partners, they couldn't really talk about it. So they just throw it out there, but you know, downplay it a little bit, just like the Chad Nichols interview that he did yeah. with um uh, what was that guy? Um the, the money guy, Edu Edu I don't know some money podcast oh yeah i know the guy you're talking about yeah, yeah. he uh, he wanted to be part of the olympia at one point so that was a good podcast and he talked and what about this oh this is trend uh, i think it's a short acting uh, i think it's a fast acting and then you really hear what's what chad is able to do and you're like oh he knows a little bit more than he's leading on so i always feel it's yeah. like a diversion i've met jay a couple times and talked to him you know off the record and he mm. seems to be a very sharp guy so i had a hard time believing what he was saying on the oh on yeah the, uh interview with greg Doucette. so i don't know i mean i jay seems to be a very calculated very intelligent mm. guy so i don't think he was being very forthcoming but like like most of us were very meticulous you know we have our, our diet and our cycle and our training log right we know exactly how many reps we're doing and progressive overload and trying to set up everything ahead of time. So I would I would expect from a pro like Jay or other IFB pros that that everything is kind of coordinated. But you know, for for public, you can't really say what they're doing anyway, because again, even if they're 100% transparent, nobody's going to believe them. And if it's something crazy, like three, four, five grams a gear, then I don't know, that's also a liability, you know, because kids are going to duplicate that. Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, he has to consider that because I know he has businesses and mm -hmm. you know, Jay's been pretty successful outside of bodybuilding. So yeah. that, that, you know, that is a factor. But I went back through and listened to it again. And, he, uh, you know, he was very careful about how he chose his words because when I, when I listened to it again, he, he talked about taking equipoise and testosterone in relatively low doses. But if you listen to what he said, he said the 90s. And that was before he was a pro. <laughs> Yeah, right. So it, it might have increased. And when you compare his physique when he was an amateur to pro physique, especially later on when he was working with Hani, I mean, he was hard as a rock. And and, and there are videos out there where he's um, with Dave Borlay. I think he was in a car driving to the Olympia, dehydrating, and then he got out of the car, started puking. And that was all documented on, um, I think, a muscular development. Just normal. The Dave Perlay published all of that. And he talked about the diuretic abuse, you know, the, or the overuse of diuretics during the time of the Olympias many, many times. So it's um, usually the, the information slowly trickles out. But as the audience, you kind of have to piece it together. Like what, you're, what you are doing and I'm doing, like laying it all out there in an Excel sheet with the diet and the dosages. When you're going to change this, this is my blood work. This is the progress pictures. I, I think we can only dream of getting something like that from an IFB pro. Maybe, maybe fingers crossed in the future. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know how transparent or how open. It seems like Dorian Yates has been fairly open about what mm. he did, but I, you know, I think a lot of people don't believe him. But I don't know. I mean, I'm almost 50 years old, and mm. um, you know, Dorian talks about, uh, you know, I've heard him talk recently talked about, you know, where he was taking around a gram and a half at the time he was an Olympian and I you know, guys don't believe that, but back in the nineties, a gram and a half was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> At least, you know, I never heard of people taking that much back then. Maybe, maybe it was a different world than I was loving it, but there, there was, you know, now everybody in the gym is taking a gram and a half. Easy. Yeah. I know guys here in Thailand taking more. I mean, I've taken more in the past two grams of test just to see, you know, what, what it would do. Yeah, I one time went up to two and a half, and it just made me sick. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> can, for me, it's, surprisingly, I tolerated the two grams of test quite well. It was just tested on an aromatized inhibitor. My blood work was reasonably okay. I looked good. I was in a caloric deficit. So I'm not during the off season, I probably wouldn't have tolerated that with too much food, too much water retention. Uh, but I, I did actually quite well. And that was pharmaceutical. So I do know people that can tolerate high dosages. But I think way back in the day, the sourcing was such an issue because they had to get Parabolin amps from France and Amesterone from this part of the world and right, and Primabolin from Turkey or Spain. I think they would just have to stock up the entire year and then realize, oh, wait, I only got 30 amps. And this is what I have to do, uh, do the prep with. Yeah, stuff was really hard to come by. And, and that was one thing that uh, that I did kind of, uh, I thought was interesting from the Jay Cutler interview is he talked about, he called them exotics. Exotics, but, yeah. exotics, but he, you know, he, he was Mr. Olympia and he said it, stuff was hard to come by. I, I, I find, honestly, I find it hard to believe that maybe I'm in a luxury position that I'm in Thailand and I could just get whatever in the pharmacy. But I do know at that time, Thai pharmacies, were already sending abroad and, and importation was not as much of an issue as it is now. And here everything was available. So there have been sources here just sending shit all over the world for 20 years already. Yeah, I remember if memory serves me correctly, like around the 2005 time frame, I remember the a lot of stuff here in the US was coming from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the DEA put the hammer down on stuff and stuff got really hard to find for a while. It was raw deal, right? Operation raw deal. Yeah, raw deal. Yeah, I had I had a friend that got busted in that. Oh, it's such a shame because, like, our bodybuilding community, it's we're always threading on the gray area because we need these drugs to become phenomenally big bodybuilders. Not so much as people think, but they are involved. But it automatically makes you makes you, your activity illegal in in ninety nine percent of the world. Right. And it's such a shame because right, it, when you look at the bodybuilding scene objectively, it's such a positive sport where we all have to yeah. undergo this un illegal route and, and, and do gray area stuff just to fulfill our passion. It's, it's really a shame, you know, that we're not ahead of our times yet. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I, people laugh at me, but I don't even drink alcohol and I go to yeah. bed at 10 30 every night. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I live a pretty boring life otherwise. Right. So you, you have your bodybuilding passion, you do your you do your job and, and right, alcohol is like a maybe a birthday thing or New Year's thing. Yeah. Yeah, same here. Same here. So we are not the kind of guys who would do drunk driving or domestic abuse or that kind of stuff. We're just no. doing our thing, uh, going through our Excel sheet to make sure that the next day is going to be productive. So it's well, I, I always say, you know, we're maybe we're born too early because the uh, information is not 100% complete yet for our bodybuilding journey. And the legality is not in our favor just quite yet. But the world is getting more liberal. I mean, TRT clinics are coming up. and Yeah. You know, it's well, just... it's way better than it was 20 years ago. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. I mean, people wouldn't even talk about it at the gym. You, so, you had, uh, so what yeah, has changed? Ahead. Yeah. So what has changed over like the last because you've been bodybuilding for a minute now. So what has changed from like when you started to now? I mean, people back in the 90s, I started lifting weights when I was in high school, probably in the early 90s. And, you know, it was always something on the fringe. And I remember thinking, you know, I, I would never do that. And I remember getting, um, you know, when I first started lifting, I bought Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia <laughs> Bodybuilding and I, I tried his workout and I, I got smaller. <laughs> when I when I was doing his workout, I'm like, wait, what the fuck is going on here? I didn't realize that uh, D ball and Nandrolone were the missing ingredients. Yeah, he uh, didn't put that in the book. And yeah, he didn't like, put that part in the book. <laughs> like a chest and back workout, and then uh, shoulders and arms. Oh no, shoulders and legs, and then arms, oh. and then repeat. And at the end of every workout, you would smell ammonia, and your your shirt would start to smell like you're burning protein. Yeah, I did. I did that also. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and I just got worse, and I couldn't figure out what the fuck was going on. And I remember getting into college, and one of my buddies uh, scored some. I, I think it was Anadrol. It might have been D ball. Who the fuck knows? But mm -hmm. he had some Anadrol and split the bag with me, and okay. that was cool. the, my, my first experience. And I remember, I remember, you know, being, you know, I was a skinny guy in college. I was like 170 pounds, and I remember being stuck my goal was to bench press two plates 
and uh, <laughs> on each side. I mean, I, I, that was like I wanted to bench press two plates before I died. Right. And I remember I was struggling with 185, and within like two or three weeks, I was I was banging out 225 for reps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was, and I'm like, that's when 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 it clicked for me. I'm like, oh, all right, this is what. <laughs> This right, is what, this is what it's all about. So you did an oral only cycle. Well, wow. I, I mean, it was just whatever yeah. you could get your hands on. I had right. no fucking clue what, what what was what back then. I didn't even know, you know. But at the time, just, did, did did were there message boards or places where you could share? No, information? the internet no, wasn't right? even. I didn't even get on the internet until I got into college. So, um, right, you know, this yeah. was pre pre internet days, and it was just rumors and stuff at the gym. And mm-hmm. you know, back then you had to get. You know, looking back on it, I can I know which guys were on. Yeah. And you had to earn the trust of those guys before they mm-hmm. even talked to yeah. you about it. And things were very limited. Most most of the time people just had shit like test, anadrol, D ball, um, you know, maybe some DECA, but that was that was the only thing you could find back then. It's not like now where you can just order whatever you want whenever you want. Right. You um, just have to worry about sterility and impotency, you know. But it, yeah, the ability so, is super high right now, maybe too high. That's why we have so many kids on uh, their first cycle at 16. So the doses like the people take now, you couldn't even do it back then if you wanted. I I remember stuff being crazy expensive. I think I paid uh, back in the nineties, I was, I I paid like a hundred dollars for, for a 10 CC bottle of test. Um, It was, it it was nuts, you know? So that was, you know, that was the black market. I'm, you know, I'm sure somebody sold to somebody who sold to me. Of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Plus uh, Uh, keep in mind the denomination of the currency. I mean, that hundred dollars now is probably two hundred dollars, right? So right. just to keep it in perspective, like hundred dollars now doesn't sound like so much, but back then, hundred dollars is probably worth two hundred dollars now. So I don't think I ever actually did a proper cycle until you know I would just do stuff here and there until I met up with Dante Trudel. Okay. Um, and I don't when I'm trying to remember when I met up with Dante. Two thousand two, two thousand three. Is that before the cycle of pennies? Because that's what I read when I was on intense muscle and I didn't even register because I was too intimidated at that age. All these big guys talking and arguing on intense muscle. So I would just read, 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 read about training strategy. I think I connected with him before he even posted that. Um, He was posting on on there occasionally about his training Mm -hmm. and he had this newsletter. I I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, that's right. He had this newsletter he put out back in the 90s that it was like underground bodybuilding or something like that that I subscribed to. And that's how I connected up with him. And I remember he charged me something like 200 bucks for six months of training. It was something crazy <laughs> or 150, something like that. That's it for the whole six months. Yeah, it was yeah, it was something crazy like that. And this was before he had his uh, supplement company. Right. And I remember him, you know, his training was just completely different than anything I had done before Um, and doing his training and, and then him, you know, he would have me run. It was back then it was low doses. It was test. And then he liked to run trend with test, you know, and you would do these short blasts, these six week blasts, and then you would come off for a couple of weeks and then six weeks, four, you know, five, six weeks, something like that. If memory serves me correctly. Yeah, and do, do load a little bit in the meantime, take care of some, uh, because I mean, Dante Trudell's doctor training is a uh, pretty hefty on the joints, especially when you get started. Yeah. I really tore up my joints, but I did it. For, that was when I, when I, when I started training with him, that was when I really first started making progress. I just kind of beat around the gym. It was just a skinny guy. And uh, with a couple of years of training to, with him, I blew up to like 290, something oh, like wow. that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I, I was a fat 290, but yeah. Okay. Uh, that's but, that's what, know, what the cycle for pennies was all about. You know, you eat, you eat some more and then, and then you eat some more and you're full, but you eat some more at that point. I remember post-workout, he would have me go to McDonald's and eat four double cheeseburgers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 